How did the Mongols get to Europe? And by annihilating Lake Half of Russia. Hi, welcome to Russian History of Russia. My name is Asya, and today's episode is dedicated to a wonderful period in Russia's teenage years, an abusive love affair with the Mongols, known as the Tatar Mongo yoke or the Horde yoke in Russian historiography. The Tatars were actually Turkic people and did nothing except for being one of the first to be obliterated by the Mongols on their way west. But the Mongols were often known as Tatars in Europe because, in classic European fashion, I guess all Asian people look the same. In other words, today we're talking about almost two and a half centuries of tributary existence of Rus under the Mongols. Ironically, it is also the period where history of actual Russia begins. The rise of Moscow, centralization of power, formation of a new self-identity, all of that happened under and to a large extent because of the Mongols. So, coming up today, Mongolian invasion of Rus its cities burning to the ground, inhabitants drowning in blood, enslavement, starvation, humiliation, the Little Ice Age and the Black Death, and the painful birth of Russia from the apocalypse and the ashes. Hell yeah! It's big, it's cold, it's full of gas and gold, it's 1200 years old but still never does as told. We're Christians but not really Europeans, but from Asia we send the dogs to space and kill the Tsars on occasion. We drink sodas made from bread, eat our enemies in Kasha. That's why it's so fun to study history of Russia. So after the 1223 visit paid by the Mongolian scout campaign that took on almost all of Rus principalities, their forces retreated. Not because they lost, because they definitely didn't. They just didn't represent the force of the full Mongolian army. They went back and reported on those sissies they found out west that were more preoccupied with fighting each other than them. So the Kuril Tai, the Great Mongolian Council, decided to send their proper representatives. Besides fighting each other and the immediate eastern neighbors, Rus rulers also had to constantly deal with the Christian knights crusading all over the place in the north. So their attention span was not ideal. After Genghis Khan's or Chinggis Khan's death, in 1227, his empire was divided into four parts between his sons, also known as Uluses. Ulus of Zhou Qi, the vast northwestern section of the empire after Zhou Qi's death, was ruled by Batu Han, Genghis Khan's grandson. And in 1235, Batu began his expansion west, with the armies commanded by Genghis Khan's general himself, Saputai. They quickly conquered pretty much everything southeast of Rus, from Crimea to Alania to Volga, Bulgaria. Rus princes had to understand the force of tsunami coming their way, since some of its first victims fled to find refuge in Vladimir Suzdal lands. In 1237, Batu's envoys came to resign in Vladimir with a shakedown, demanding one-tenth of everything – wealth, people, even horses. Resign was feeling sassy and supposedly replied, when we're all gone, you can take it all. And they kinda did. The city of Vladimir, then ruled by Yuri II, did give them tributes, but at the same time sent forces to aid Resign. Resign was flattened before they even got there, and then so were the forces that came to help. Mongols are universally famous for their non-discriminatory policies when it comes to punishing those who say no to them. They would just kill everyone, with no exception for young and old, erasing whole cities from history and from maps. Many Rus towns that we do know existed, we can't even locate because there's just nothing left. Being enslaved or recruited into the Mongol army was pretty much the best outcome you could hope for when encountering them. Done with resign, Mongols moved north into the Vladimir Suzdal lands, burning down everything in their path. Like so, after a five-day siege, a small city of Moscow was destroyed among the first. Yuri II of Vladimir in the meantime left his capital to go gather more troops, leaving almost all of his family in the city. They all died, along with a bunch of Vladimir inhabitants after a week-long siege. Yuri himself was met by the Mongol secondary forces, his army obliterated, and his headless body found by a bishop and a pile of corpses left behind. His head was eventually located too, supposedly, if it makes anybody feel any better. One by one, all East Rus major centers along the Volga River were conquered. Ironically enough, all of that happened in the winter months of 1237-1238, which means the Mongols did exactly that – conquered Russia in winter. 
before it was cool. It isn't 100% clear why Mongolian army turned south before reaching Novgorod. Most likely because of the spring flooding of the roads, all the losses they sustained by the time they got to the border, as well as all the nice loot weighing them down. They grazed Smolensk and Chernigov principalities next, although bypassed the biggest centers. While most Rus cities fell within just a few days, there was this one trooper by the name of Kazelsk. It wasn't a particularly large city, and it was ruled by a 12-year-old boy, and even the name kind of meant goat city. Yet somehow this is where the great Mongolian army got stuck for seven weeks. It did eventually, according to the Chronicle, drown in blood, of course. The only city that managed to withstand longer than that was Kiev, around 13 weeks. After Kazelsk, Mongols took a bit of a spring break and relocated back south into the steppe region, conquering that as well, including Crimea. They came back in the fall of 1239, and by the fall of 1240, they conquered pretty much all of southern Rus principalities, destroyed Chernigov, and took Kiev. When the Mongols reached Volodymyr Volinsky, the capital of unified Halych and Volin, other Huns that were Batu's Rus conquering buddies went back to Mongolia. That was an important event because it significantly decreased his manpower. Pretty much thanks to that, Galicia was another Rus principality that kind of dodged the bullet. Despite that, Batu still crossed the Carpathian Mountains, adding plunging through the lands of Hungary and the devastation of the Polish kingdom to the list of his accomplishments. He marched all the way to Saxony, you know, the one in today's Germany, which is absolutely mind-blowing if you think about where he had started. The Mongols reached Germany. What stopped Batu was getting the news about the death of the Great Hun, so he returned to the steppe regions of the Golden Horde. He founded his capital, Sarai Batu, on the Volga River close to the Caspian Sea Delta, about 130 kilometers or 80 miles north of modern-day Russian city of Astrakhan. Neither Sarai Batu or its sibling, the New Sarai, founded nearby, survived beyond the existence of the Golden Horde Empire. We barely even have any archaeological evidence from them since most of the buildings were deconstructed and the materials used by the villages in the area in the following centuries. But that will happen much later. In the 13th-14th centuries, the Golden Horde was the most powerful state entity in the world. However, almost none of the conquered lands of Rus were actually a part of it, with the exception of the southern regions, which did fit the nomadic lifestyle of the Mongols, so they were incorporated. Instead, Batu did what the Mongols were known for for, besides the no city left unburned policy, he established a vassal state. He did not enforce any laws, religion, languages, or even rulers upon Rus. He didn't even establish a Mongol military presence. Just the barely bearable tributes and a humiliating tradition of Yerlik, an official mandate to rule issued by the Huns to the Rus princes. In order to earn Yerlik, which granted both power and the scraps from the tributes collection privileges, Rus princes fought each other, which made it so much easier for the Mongols to sustain their rule and squash any uprisings. Often those uprisings didn't even need much squashing. Rus elites, terrified of Mongols' revenge, would just overthrow the princes that were getting too cocky. Those visits to Sarai were not nice at all. The princes were often treated with disrespect and humiliated and occasionally killed, which I would argue is still better than wiped out of existence. The only other major principality besides Galicia that dodged the Mongol bullet was the Novgorod Republic, but they too just surrendered preemptively. Galicia Volinia and its ruler Daniil did try to get support from Hungary to get from under the Mongol tributes, but quickly learned what a bad idea that is, and stayed a tributary to the Mongols, disconnecting from the other principalities more and more, including Kiev, which was at this point even abandoned by the Metropolitan Bishop of the Russian Orthodox Church, who moved to Vladimir. Daniil's grandsons, Lev and Andrei, the last two of the Galician Volinian branch of Rurikoviches, divided the two principalities between them and both suspiciously died in 1323, most likely poisoned, and the lands were incorporated into Lithuanian kingdom. Beryaslavl principality was swallowed by the Golden Horde almost entirely. Chernigov and Kiev were impoverished and disintegrated, and the rest just sort of dissolved into the new borders. The fateful decision that Batu Han made 
decade that predetermined the rise of Moscow and existence of Russia was granting the Vladimir Suzdal princes the Great Yerlik, basically declaring them the Grand Princes of Rus, and that Yerlik symbolically included Kiev as well. After the brother of Yuri II of Vladimir died in Mongolian capital of Karakorum, his son Alexander Nevsky became the Grand Prince. Alexander was literally simultaneously fighting off the Livonian order in the north, and those guys were in it under the banners of bringing Slavs to the right version of the Christian god, so arguably much scarier than the Mongols. So Alexander decided that it wasn't the time nor place to resist Batu, especially considering that he wasn't enforcing such terrible conditions. And he wasn't wrong, those princes who disagreed with such course of action and defied the Hun were killed, and their lands devastated all over again. Alexander's fight against the Crusaders earned him a great amount of respect in Novgorod. So he basically ended up as a ruler of Vladimir Suzdol, Kiev, Novgorod, and even Smolensk, also acting as a peacekeeper between Rus and the Mongols. After Alexander Nevsky's death in 1263, his sons, who weren't blessed with such political insight, began another wave of internecine wars, which in return caused the Mongols to visit more often to punish the misbehaving princes. And all this mess led to the rise of some new players, most importantly Tver and Moscow, which I'll get to in a couple of minutes. Despite Mongols' not-so-tyrannic rule, their invasion changed the lands of former Rus forever. Archaeological evidence shows that two-thirds of the cities in their path were burned to the ground, and a quarter was never reborn again, ceasing to exist entirely. Huge masses of population were enslaved and taken to the Golden Horde or even further east. Mongols especially targeted skilled craftsmen, taking them as valuable slaves, destroying, in some cases, all knowledge of certain crafts, such as rare animal jewelry production or high-quality chain mail armor. Forget the unusually high levels of grammar. Books, monuments, family kept knowledge and skills were all destroyed in those flames. It is estimated that only about 0.1% of pre-invasion written materials survived to modern days. Even construction halted, no stone buildings were erected for almost half a century. If that wasn't enough, timely as always, Rus was hit by the Little Ice Age that began in Europe around 1300s, shrinking the already scarce food sources even more. And and by the Black Death. I've heard a bunch of really nice historical myths about how Russian banya, the saunas, stopped the plague from spreading in the Rus lands, but that's just not true. The epidemic in the 14th century was just as bad. The Rus cities just weren't as densely populated as European ones, especially after the Mongols. Judging from literally sources, it was hard for survivors to come to terms with what had happened to them. First, the invasion was seen as the end of times, the end of everything. Everything. When the dust settled, however, they realized that the European neighbors to the west are quite alright, and it's only the Rus that, to their knowledge, was burned to ashes. So it was then seen as God's punishment, which in return led to strengthening of faith and Christianization of even the most remote pagan areas. At the same time, if it weren't for the Mongolian invasion, Russia and Moscow, the way we know them today, wouldn't have existed at all. All that blood spilled by the Mongols fertilized processes that led to the new self-identity, new powerful centers, and new government framework. Which brings us to Moscow and Tver. The least valuable of Alexander Nevsky's patrimonies was inherited by one of his youngest children, Daniil. Daniil's mojo was slow and steady, wins the race. He quickly built up Moscow, milking its secluded, forested location for peace and prosperity. His policies for a change provided lack of any military action, which under the circumstances was a really attractive feature. That quickly increased the population of the city with migrants from the neighboring lands, and survivors who returned from hiding in the woods to their homes burned down and destroyed. That is, until he suddenly changed his mind and in the last few years of his life began power-grabbing nearby cities and even fighting for Novgorod and a Grand Duchy of Vladimir. Moscow, however, wasn't the front-runner even among its peers. It had a twin, you see, Tver, a city 180 kilometers or 100 miles northwest of Moscow 
Francisco, founded in relatively the same time and way. After Alexander, Tver Prince Yaroslav secured the Grand Prince title and was the first to formally rule Vladimir while still residing in his hometown, which quickly bumped Tver to the rank of a noticeable principality. Yaroslav of Tver was doing pretty well, successfully navigating the intricacies of his own rule, the Mongol control, and helping out Novgorod against Livonia. With Tver leading the way, both cities entered the 14th century as ambitious, capable, and advantageously located contenders for dominance, opening on a century-long chapter known in Russian historiography as the rivalry of Moscow and Tver. And you can probably guess which one came out on top. That is all for today. In the next episode, the first Ivan, the first Kremlins, and the first victory against the Mongols. Stay tuned, I'll see you then. Bye.